it is like a marriage. You just can't walk away from your responsibility. Uh, you got to show up for it every day and you can't be down. You've got to be on. Welcome to In the Thick of It. I'm your host, Scott Hallrow. In this episode, I sit down with Mike DeRosa, founder of DeRosa Mangold Consulting, a value-added reseller of Sage Intact, based just outside of Waco, Texas. Mike shares a unique journey from small town Texas to founding his own business after careers in public accounting and software sales. He offers advice for entrepreneurs starting their own businesses, emphasizes having the finances to withstand the ups and downs, investing in your dream, and staying relentlessly focused on your vision. Mike also reflects on lessons learned from childhood entrepreneurial ventures like hauling hay to his days auditing for big accounting firms. From riding his bike everywhere as a kid to flying planes and riding motorcycles as an adult, Mike has always followed his own path. Welcome back to In the Thick of It. Mike, thanks so much for making the trip up here from Waco today. Welcome to In the Thick of It. You're in the hot seat. Appreciate you being here. I already mentioned you're from Waco. Tell us a little bit about you know where you live and what life's like down there. So an interesting about Waco is a lot of us don't actually live in Waco. We say we live in Waco because that's easier for everybody to understand. So I grew up uh, a little bit in Waco and then China Spring, which is a community, not even a town, a school district and a post office to the uh, north of Waco, north, northwest. And I currently live in Hewitt, which is a suburb to the uh, south of Waco. Is that where Chip and JoJo like to uh, do their thing? I actually don't know anything about those guys. So Seriously? <laughs> I really don't. You, you live <laughs> so, in the area and I like, do. you I don't do. run into the gains around town? Um, and- I don't. You know, what do they say about consultants? You have to cross three rivers to be an expert, right? So, so yeah, most of my, most of my customers are actually outside of the Waco area. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know much about those guys other than what I hear other people say, which I, who knows if that any of that's true. I so. came across Chip at the Fort Worth Rodeo a couple of years ago. And it's one of those, he just walked by and I did a double take and I'm like, I know that guy. Yeah. He doesn't know me. Yeah, I've watched some of the episodes, but that whole, I was a Bob Vila home improvement kind of guy and, you know, Tim Allen. But yeah, the newer shows are more like, you know, idea to finished in 30 minutes or or an hour, not, you know, the originals were like, we're going to work on this house for a whole season, right? You know, and there would be a whole episode to, you know, just the doors or the windows or the roof or whatever. I enjoyed that more how-to the aspect of it. So are you handy? I guess. I rarely pay for professional services. <laughs> so I do most of my own work, yeah. When I was um, 12, my dad and I, built our house that would become the house that I was in high school in on a bluff overlooking the Brazos River. So it wouldn't be classified as a tiny house today, but it was a small house. It was not very many rooms or many formal rooms, uh, more like a couple of big rooms. Yeah, I can do plumbing. We did our electrical. I'm talking to a truss company right now. So I remember ordering the trusses and we invited the whole family over to put the trusses up Wow! one weekend and then we roofed the following weekend. We've got a leak in one of our conference rooms. So after we record, I'm going to go put you to work. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> I stink at drywall. So uh, you probably want to get a professional okay, for that. Fair enough. It's very artistic. Yeah. So grew up in the greater Waco area still live in the greater Waco area. Did you leave at all or? I've never lived more than 25 miles from where I was born. Wow. And they destroyed the place I was born. So it's a field. It no longer exists. And where'd you go to school? So through fifth grade, I was in Waco, uh, Cedar Ridge Elementary. Uh, If you saw E.T., I was part of one of those bicycle gangs, right? We rode our bikes everywhere. I I couldn't afford a Stingray, so I think I had a Sears Spider. Starting in uh, sixth grade, uh, we moved out to China Spring. Totally different culture. I graduated 66 in our class. So we knew everybody, not only in our class, but the classes above us and below us. 
And yeah, I was thinking about that. Some of the questions you told me you were going to ask. Uh, my very first employment, I was 15. I worked at a gas station, bait shop, small grocery store. Because the owner was concerned that I was 15, he left the money <laughs> out on the counter every Wednesday afternoon, and I was supposed to pick it up. So he would leave the money and I would pick it up so there wouldn't be a paper trail that he was paying a 15-year-old. Gotcha. We won't say the name of that uh, gas station. Statute of limitations, I'm sure, is long since It's, it's, uh, it's passed, long but... gone. And yeah, anybody from China Spring who's listening to this will know exactly know who, who I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it was just kind of a great place to grow up. Before I actually got a W-2 job, I started, I guess my first business was hay hauling a couple of weeks before my 16th birthday. So I was driving illegally. And so were my friends. Again, statute of limitations yeah. has passed. It's <laughs> so, been enough time since Mike was 16. Yeah, but, you know, I was only supposed to go to the field uh, on some farm-to-market roads for my house. That's as far as I was supposed to be going. So, so yeah. I went to school at Texas A&M and met people that were from big cities, but met a lot of people that were from small country towns. The people from the small towns had the best stories. I got to believe like you and some buddies in a field, like there has to be some good growing up in China Springs story. Oh yeah, there are. Care to share one? (laughs) Not too incriminating. I don't know that anything in particular comes to mind. Uh, We used to joke about what it would be like to go on a date, right? So you've probably heard the country and Western song. I don't even know who sang it. You know, I'll start walking your way. You start walking you mine. You start walking mine. Yeah. We'll meet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I live that, except it, we met at Patrick's Crossing on the Brazos River. Shorter walk from her house. Longer walk from mine. That's how it should be. Yeah. Down the river. I can identify with those type of songs. There wasn't a lot to do. We can only get like two TV stations. So I was fortunate. I'd grown up city life been out there and I could get off the bus, I could get my shotgun or my fishing pole, take the dog. We didn't have a fenced yard. The dog just knew to stay around the house or go with us and go up and down the Brazos River. And if I wanted to shoot at something, I could shoot at something. (laughs) If I wanted to fish, I could fish. It was tremendously different. Friends of mine, I didn't, but friends of mine would usually have a rifle in the back window of their truck when they came to school. Yeah. And that was totally normal. Totally normal. It changed really after I graduated. They would have dogs go through the parking lot, I guess, looking for drugs. And if you had a spent shotgun shell in the bed of your pickup, you'd be in trouble. Interesting. So there was a some <laughs> transformation that had to happen. We were kind of in a pocket of time. It was a great experience. My first business was hauling hay. To advertise my business, I wrote on the back of my dad's business card, hay hauling. I put my phone number and I said, call after seven because we didn't have answering machines, you know, and I was on a party line. One of the very last people in China Springs to have a party line. And somehow I would connect with people and they would call me and I would go haul their hay for, there was three of us. So one guy in the back of the truck, one guy driving and one guy on the ground. How long did you do that for? It was really just a season. And I just heard that you could do this and make money. So you could get 45 bales, 40 to 45 bales in a standard pickup bed. You could get up to 25 cents a bale. And it was like, oh, this just sounds great. And so got a couple of friends to join me. And we showed up for our first job and there was a thunderstorm coming. And I know these ranch hands knew we didn't know what the heck we were doing. And we're sticking these bills in the back of the truck and we're not going to get a dozen back there, much less 45. <laughs> and they come out and they taught us. They taught us how to stack them, you know, and how to put them in the barn. And, you know, basically it'd be like hiring a plumber and saying, okay, this is how you turn off the water. They nice enough to show us everything about the job. And then we just kind of went from there. And when that season was over, then I ended up getting a my first W-2 job, which was at a Piggly Wiggly grocery store. They didn't leave the cash on the counter for you to take that? No, no, no. I had to punch in, punch out. And it's amazing because, uh, you know, you're a business owner. I'm a business owner. One of the things you have to learn is uh, 
sometimes you have to let a customer go. Mm -hmm. We call it firing a customer. I actually fired my first customer hauling hay. Really? Yeah. We were out there and usually when you got a job, the field was full of hay bales and you just got after it and you would work from dawn to dusk, sometimes after dark to get them in, you know, before a storm came. We showed up on this one job and the guy was still baling hay. And we said, okay, well, we'll follow him for a while. It, was, it takes a long time, right? And then he didn't have regular barns. We were having to lift it through windows and store it in bedrooms of this old house. And finally, I, I told his wife, I said, uh, I said, I've got other people calling me for jobs. They've got hay in the field. We'll come back. We're going to go clear this other field and we'll be back day after tomorrow. She was like, I'm going to call your competition. And I was like, okay, how about it? Here's his number. But yeah, it was uh, lessons that I ultimately use today that you just can't make everybody happy. You have to prioritize. We've had to fire some customers in our business. And I'll tell you what, it's not something that's pleasant. It's not something that anybody wants to do. No. But at the same time, I cannot tell you how much relief I have felt getting on the other side of those difficult conversations because at some point, the business just isn't worth it. And it drags you way down and it's just not worth the revenue that you generate. And I think it's best for everybody. It's healthy for everybody. And in an environment today where the market for talent is so, it's difficult to hire, it's difficult to keep people when you've got those difficult customers, it doesn't make people want to stay. And I think as an employer, it's also important to tell your people, show your people that you've got their back and that you're you're not going to put up with a difficult customer. Yeah. And there's probably a reason behind that, right? Everybody's different and everybody works better with different people. It's a good indicator. If you're getting sick at your stomach every time a person calls you, they're going to be just as relieved as you are when you decide to go different directions. So I'm not the only one that's had that stick at the stomach uh, feeling. Actually, it's one of the best indicators. Your body is telling you there's something wrong here and you're not addressing it and you need to do something about it. You know, same thing. We've parted ways with a few employees over the years. Sure. And we've done a really good job of managing. They're still friends and some of them have become customers, you know, after they, they've left. But it's usually relieving to everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, thank God. Yeah. And it happens with customers, too. I mean, what we do, I think you told me you were going to ask me what DeRosa Mangold does. And my smart answer is, but we answer the phone. You know, my son told his teacher when he was in grade school, what's your dad doing? He goes, well, he talks on the phone. We spend a tremendous amount of time talking to our customers and coming up with solutions and troubleshooting and making sure everybody understands what's going on. You and I were having a conversation about that earlier, uh, you know, helping a customer understand what's going on. If you have a sickness in the pit of your stomach every time you have that conversation because communication's not happening, it's really just better. It's better for everybody. There's somebody else out there for that person that will help them thrive. Sure. And if you're not helping them thrive, it's better for them. And they're certainly not helping you thrive. I think that's a really good point, too. Just because two people or two organizations aren't a match to work with one another, that doesn't mean that one is inherently bad or, or no. anything like that. It's just like in a dating relationship, right? If you're dating somebody and the chemistry just isn't there, you're not a good match from one another. It doesn't make sense to stay in the relationship. You part ways amicably and find a relationship that does work. Yeah. I mean, it's the ultimate expression of love is to will the good of the other. Hey, I'm sorry. It's probably better for you to find somebody else who you connect with a sure. lot better. And we do the same thing, right? I mean, when I turned 30, I, I learned how to fly. And uh, I went through, I kind of interviewed a couple of guys and gals before I decided. And, you interviewed people to help train you? To yeah, fly? My, my instructor. And I, I connected with one gentleman, I, and we're still friends today. He got a job with the airlines shortly after I got my private. And I wanted my instrument rating and I had to kind of go through that process again. So I, I was with a couple of instructors, but, you know, it just really wasn't clicking. And then there was a young lady flying a uh, for a UPS out of uh, McGregor at our airport and uh, just kind of caught her in the pilot's lounge one day. And I, I said, you still do any instructing? She goes, yeah. I said, I'm looking for an instrument instructor. And we really, I understood what she was saying kind of from the start, 
both of those people, you know, my private instructor and my instrument instructor today, if I'm in a situation, they're both in my head talking to me. Yeah. So, yeah, you want relationships to coach you, mentor you, move you through business, other parts of your life that make sense to you, that allow you to thrive. You know, it's, a, it's as easy as that, and it's as complicated as that. Yeah. So, Kind of going back to growing up and getting into college, where'd you go to school? What'd you study? So I started at MCC, which is the community college. And is that the, McClellan County Community College? McClellan Community McClellan. College. Yeah, uh, the Highlanders. I'd actually grown up just outside that campus, so knew it like the back of my hand back when I was you know, riding my bicycle. I, that was my favorite place to ride. But I was fortunate enough to, again, not real impressive because we only had 66 in the class, but I graduated in the top 10%. So I was right. just skinning my teeth. I was number six. I remember my mother was so angry that I was number six. She was like, you could have done better. You could have been <laughs> valedictorian. But I was like, you know, hey, I just made it in. I'm, I'm number six. So I got the coveted uh, scholarship. So top 10% in the county would get a scholarship. So that's where I was going. It was paid for. Hadn't talked to a counselor until I show up at the school to register for my first semester. And they were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. I was something in business. So I went down as general business. Took classes during the summer and uh, took my first accounting class in the fall. And uh, it just made sense to me. I'm a debit credit guy. I can see debits and credits like other people can see colors. And I remember thinking, people sitting around me were like asking me questions. And I was like, yeah, it's easy. All you have to do is add, subtract, multiply, and divide, right? No complex math here. And uh, I just remember thinking, people make money doing this? I can do this. So that's how I decided to become an accounting, accounting major. This, this will not be the last time, and it may not be the first time I've said this on the podcast, but... Yeah. Among the top 10 happiest days in my life are, and this is like the eight and nine or nine and 10 spot, are the days that I completed managerial and financial accounting in college. Uh -huh. I got C's in both of them. I was not a C student. I could not have been happier <laughs> than to have just gotten out with a C. And I remember going into, I guess it was financial accounting, thinking, oh, this is going to be easy. It's just adding and subtracting. I distinctly remember telling somebody, how hard could this be? It's just adding and subtracting. And they just kind of rolled their eyes and said, talk to me at the end of the semester. And oh boy, it is not just adding and subtracting. It's all about classification, mm -hmm. right? Which is one of the reasons why we've gotten into Sage Intact with such a vengeance is we can classify till the cows come home, mm -hmm. right? And we can finally use the general ledger for what it was intended in that that's a database. So I always had that fascination with money and financials. My, my mom was a bookkeeper. You were clearly a very hard worker. You grew up, it sounds like, with a very solid work ethic from a really young age. I guess. I mean, it was where your friends were and it was something to do. I mean, staying inside your house wasn't exciting or an option, right? Want to get out there, want to be around people, want to be doing things. So yeah, um, I would, uh, my junior, senior year in high school, I would go from school straight to work and we would close at nine. I'd have to close up, get out of there about 9.30, about 30 minute drive to the house because I was out in China Spring and yeah, I'd get home about 10 and I'd either have to do my homework before or after. I don't think you do those kind of things. I mean, we really weren't paid a lot. I mean, at the time, it was it was really hard to make enough money to make a car payment. But I think you do those things because you enjoy it. It was like my second family. I enjoyed being around the people, enjoyed doing the job, enjoyed helping people. Ended up doing just about every job that was there. I worked throughout college there. People talk about work ethic a lot, and I think people who maybe don't have a solid work ethic haven't really discovered the joy or the pleasure or the social interaction that you can have. When you're doing something well, it's fun, 
And when you're around people who are like-minded, it's fun. And why wouldn't you want to be there doing those things, be part of a group that does it? So after college, take me through that. What did the rest of college look like? It sounds like you discovered accounting very early on. What was the rest of school like for you? And what'd you do afterward? I had another business in college. I was a photographer, a wedding photographer. I didn't invest in that business. Like I didn't, equipment was going to be thousands of dollars and I didn't make that investment. I wonder sometimes if I had, if I would have just gone off in that direction or not, but I I didn't make that investment in the equipment. So it limited what I could do. I got out of music in college. I, I was a trumpet player. My band director was trying to push me more towards jazz. And I remember saying out loud, uh, no, I'm a business major. I got to focus on my business grades. And so I got out of that. So yeah, I was distilling down or fine tuning down what I wanted to do. And I even like uh, the last uh, year and a half, I, I did all my, against the advice of my counselors, I did all my accounting classes and management information system and accounting information system classes all at once. I was drawn by the PC, the personal computer, local area network development, accounting systems on computers, was really drawn by that. Wanted to do that, but it was an emerging industry at that time and CPA firms were just not there yet. I had a little bit of a scare. I almost failed my first auditing class which was a natural for me uh, because everything else was kind of coming easy on the accounting side. So I signed up for the second one because (laughs) because I almost failed the first one. I signed up for the second one and got an internship over Christmas break to go work on audits and it was savings and loans and went out and worked on my first savings and loan audit. I spent most of my time in front of the copy machine, but I did learn some things came back, aced the second auditing class because now that I had done it... Seen it in the real world. Yeah, it just made sense. Um, Yeah. You talk about you spent most of your time just standing around the copier. sounds like you were probably doing the grunt work there. Oh, yeah. And I was fortunate to be able to intern uh, in the marketing department for a software company when I was in, in college. I was doing grunt work. I was cleaning up database stuff. I was literally looking at rows and rows and rows and looking for duplicates manually and figuring out which ones to delete and merge and and all that. The work itself is whatever. I think that there's so much to be gained just from being in an office environment, being in a professional environment, and just kind of understanding how an office works, how a company works. The job, yeah, you need to develop and and learn new skills, but I think there's a lot to be gained just by being around people and the things that you pick up through osmosis. Oh, yeah. As an auditor, it was a requirement. So once I, you know, public accounting was my first career and I was an auditor and then an audit manager. On every audit, you were required what we would call the revenue cycle. It was basically the internal control cycle of quote to cash is what we would call it today. And then the expense cycle would also be, you know, what we call order to cash or procure to cash. And we had to document that for for each organization. And of course, we were measured by the audit partner by the quality of our management letters, what we recommended to the business uh, at the end. So we're looking, we're looking for things that could be improved. And yeah, you would document that cycle and you would just find nobody really taught us how to do this. And so to me, I'm finding really basic things like we're not making sure the amount of money that we put in the bank equaled the amount of money that we're putting on the books or the amount of money that we received is making it to the bank. Basic things like that. And you would see them sometimes in like really big organizations. Probably the first time I really got scared, I was left alone on a project with the, uh, sorry, I can't remember the name of the organization, but during the savings and loan crisis, the government took over the savings and loan and service loans, and we had some contracts. One of the contracts was to look at the internal controls of one of these processing units, and I, I was down in Houston for, I was left alone for like a month, which was terrifying. <laughs> it was, you know, just 
no supervision, write a report. So I'm wandering the halls for a couple of weeks and I'm asking and I'm documenting flow charting, you know, money as it goes from point A to point B and entries into the accounting system. And I wrote my report and what scared me even more is my supervisor just barely looked at it. It just turned it in. Next thing I know, I'm being called into a meeting to the main office in Dallas. So I'm in a mahogany walls, you know, very nice looking office setting. I'm there with the person who didn't really look at my report very much, right? The guy comes in, has my report in his hand. The guy being the partner uh, of the firm? Or? No, he was a governmental contractor. He was part of the government, overlooking the RIT, RTC, Resolution Trust Corporation. That escaped me there for a minute. And so he's got my report in his hand and he comes in, takes my report and just slams it down on the desk and says, I cannot believe this. I feel this big, like, oh my gosh, I should have been supervised, right? <laughs> and he goes, I cannot believe how basic, how basic these findings are. We're not even doing the basics of internal control. And then I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm okay. So I'm not, not going to die today. He wasn't with your report. He wasn't. He was thankful that I had found these things. And where are some of our experiences, right? It taught me something that don't overlook the obvious. Don't overlook the basics. The basics are important. Also taught me accounting. People's lives are at stake. People lost their jobs because of those basics. And it was those basics I described. Money was coming in and wasn't being compared to money being applied to loans. And guess what? When they tried, it was hard to reconcile. Mm -hmm. It was They had a hard time matching those numbers up, which you would think for the banking industry, any bank, I had audited banks up until that point, that's basic. You balance every day. Banks actually close every day. Every morning they close which is why I kind of chuckle a little bit when a business owner tells me, oh, there's, there's just no way. We, ha we have to have a month to close the books. And I was like, your bank does it every day. Mm -hmm. And they're handling way more transactions than you are. And they've got way much more financial responsibility. They balance every single day. So yeah, you kind of learn from those experiences. But anyway, not the country story you were looking for. But, right. <laughs> but more of a professional story. Going from audit to what you do today, actually, first, tell us what do you do today? What is your business? Other than answering the phone. Other, other than other answering than the phone. I want everybody to hear that, by the way, because that's why our customers love us. They can just call us and talk to us about their systems. And it's so hard to do that today. Uh, so much of that has gone, gone away. Really, what we're doing is we're helping business get the information they need. I'm probably going too long. If you want this other story. I remember an individual, a banker, and we're coming into those days again with high inflation and interest rates going up. Interest rates were so high during the 80s and early 90s that bankers were having this idea that, why don't we do this? Every time you receive cash, it's a loan payment. And every time you write checks, it's a draw. That way we're paying off the maximum we can against your loan. Because literally, if you looked at a company that wasn't making money, and if you took away their interest expense, they were solvent. Their financing was putting them out of business. And so bankers came up with this idea. Well, in doing so, remember, not very computerized. We're just now getting the local area networks going. We're just now getting small business into the computing age. You took away the one key metric a business owner used to manage their business. And that was how much cash they had because mm -hmm. cash now became zero. And they couldn't translate that to their line of credit balance. It just basically disappeared on them. And when that metric disappeared, I saw three businesses. The banker had great advice for reducing interest rates. Okay. It was a great plan for reducing interest rates. But I saw three businesses that once that metric of a cash balance was removed, go out of business mm. in less than a year. So it's like, yeah, as boring as accounting sounds, people's lives are at stake. Giving the decision makers the information that they need 
to make good decisions, whether you agree or disagree with the metric that they happen to look at, you need to provide it to them because they're the leader. They know what they need. And if you change it on them or you give them a world that they don't understand, they can make bad decisions and people's lives are affected. Yeah. So I like to think that's what we do is help that business owner get the information they need. I might have an opinion as to what would be good information for you to look at or information I could provide, but my responsibility is to give you the information that you need to run your business and give it to you on a timely basis. In other words, when it matters, not after it's already over with. So talk to me about starting your business, your business today, because you've had many businesses over the years. Tell the audience the, the name of your, your firm. Our company is DeRosa Mangold Consulting. It started out as DeRosa Consulting, and I discovered there was things that I didn't know how to do, and I was either going to need to hire somebody or bring somebody in. And I was taught and raised by a mentor here in the DFW area to have lunch every month with your competitors. So he had his own CPA firm, but previously uh, worked for a BDO firm in Austin. I think it was BDO. And we were always trying to hire each other. Well, he wasn't going to work for anybody, and I wasn't going to go to work for anybody. So we became partners. He could do the installations of the software on the servers and, and do some of the things that I couldn't do. He, he ended up teaching me to do things like imports and data manipulation and things like that. That's where Thomas Mangold, my partner, came from. Um, and I've always stayed on in my company, in the software side. And there was a time he asked me to come into public accounting, but I was like, no. I was like, I kind of found my home. This is where I want to stay. I really don't want to get back into all the other things that public accountants do. Anyway, I'm happy for the accounting profession to take care of that. So... But how I got started was I had left public accounting. I'd become a director of finance for a large nonprofit. And I got kind of bored. I remember a friend of mine telling me I was upset at some little inner office political thing. And I was complaining about it. And I was complaining on the phone to a friend about it. And he said, you know, your problem, Mike, is you retired too early. What did he mean by that? Well, I was bored. I had taken them from a month and a half to do their clothes, which just do the bath. That's not sustainable. Right. To three business days. I treated it like an audit. It was a mini audit. And I was just signing off. And I was just making sure all the boxes were checked. They were having me do some special projects. So I did uh, some uh, video conferencing work, helped us get, you know, the first digital lines into Waco so we could do video conferencing over it. I was always attracted by what my reseller did, the, the gentleman who sold us uh, what was then Mass 90. He had invited me to dinner, met him for dinner, and he offered me a job as a salesperson. And I couldn't imagine an accountant being a salesperson. I don't know why I couldn't imagine that, because when I was in public accounting, I kind of sold audits. I would go around and sign up counties and cities and school districts for us to do their audits throughout the state. But I, I couldn't imagine it. To me, it was a stretch. It was a risk. And Brian was probably about three years old at the time. Brian is your son? Yeah. And I had another son, Eric, on the way. So I said no. And uh, stuck it out until after Eric was born. Okay. And then I called this gentleman back up and I said, uh, you still want to hire me? And he was about to call me anyway and uh, ended up going to work for him. Loved it. Learned a lot about the industry. It was kind of what I always wanted to do. Going back to management information, accounting information classes. I always wanted to help businesses with computing and data management and providing that information killing the month end close because I'd done it. I'd actually done it. And he sold the business. I'd been there like, I don't know, two years. He sold the business. How old were you at this point? That's a good question. That's Late really 20s, good question. early 30s? At this point, when he sold the business, I would have probably been about 34, 35. The new owners, great guy, but he was like, who's this guy in Waco? 
drive into Austin where we only have one employee, other employee, and everybody else is in Dallas. What's that all about? They kind of didn't understand me and my position, wanted everybody in Dallas. And kind of while that was going on, I was like, you know, I've always wanted to have my own business. Maybe now is the time to give it a try. And so, yeah, it was just after it was my 36th birthday, I think. It was July of 1999. Probably the worst time at all to get into accounting Dot com software. bust is looming and 9-11's right around the 9-11 corner. 9-11 was around the corner, but, you know, everybody was saying everybody has already bought the software that they're going to buy. My last day, I closed a deal for my employer. At my exit interview, I handed my boss a $70,000 check from a customer that I signed on for them. Next day, I showed up at an executive suite with a folding table, $100 Office Depot secretary chair, and a phone. You were in business. Zero customers, zero leads, dialing for dollars. I closed my first deal in like 90 days. I told my wife I was going to do it. It's probably not going to work out. I'll probably be looking for a job in a year, but I was pretty confident I could find something in public accounting or Way to sell it to your wife. <laughs> well, How, yeah. What was the conversation like? I, I remember the conversation with my wife when I, when I told her what I was wanting to do. How did it, that go with your wife? It was identical to the conversation we had when I said I wanted to learn how to fly, which I did on my 30th birthday. Her question was, I, I just have one question. I said, okay, what's your question? Said, Will I be able to buy groceries? And I said, yes, you'll be able to buy groceries. So with the flying, I got a life insurance policy. And uh, with the business, we had saved up enough money. I financed the equipment aspect and the marketing cost, not my salary. And I drew from savings every two weeks. So I had a year of net pay saved up, not gross pay, but net pay. And I said, yeah, I'll draw from savings for a year. I told my banker, who's a friend of mine, and by the way, everybody should have a local banker and a friend in the banking industry. But he and I were in an investment club together when I was at the CPA firm. And I said, his name is Joe. And I said, Joe, I want to borrow enough money to buy like a nice Suburban, but there's not going to be a Suburban. And I'll pay you back, you know, over five years. There's just not going to be a car. And he said, I can sell that. And I said, okay. I, he said, I need a business plan. So I came up with a business plan. I need a, I need a projection. My goal was to build $10,000 a month. That was on my original projection. And that was it. And I kind of didn't expect to succeed, but I was going to do it. I was going to do it so I could walk in later and say, okay, guys, I've been an auditor. I've been a tax preparer. I've been a director of finance and I've been a business owner. I now have a 360 degree view. And then somewhere around 70 to 90 to 120 days, Something just kicked in. I said, you, you need to get some dollars coming in the door. By the end of the first year, I was able to withdraw my salary, which was greater than the previous year. As a W-2 employee working for yes, somebody else. Yes, but which is what you should do, right? You know, don't be a sole proprietor, be a corporation. Mm -hmm. You can be an S corporation. Yeah, deduct those payroll taxes. You start a business that you're not expecting to succeed. Mm -hmm. You convince a bank to give you a loan equivalent to the value of a car, but there was no car. Right. It was my third bank try, by the way. It took three tries. Okay. Some guy wanted me to plant radishes. I don't know what he was talking about. I don't know why I didn't go to Joe first because he's a friend of mine, but I didn't. Within a year's time, though, you were at or above what you were making working for somebody else. What did that feel like? you know, a Dale Carnegie kind of thing, right? I can tell you where I was standing. I can tell you the smell in the air. I can tell you the building I was in because I took the money and I put in my brokerage account. So one of the advantages of getting paid like a farmer, which goes back to my roots, right? It was harvest time. I was able to save. I put like $10,000 away because I had been, you know, on a meager salary all year that was coming out of my savings. And I harvested my salary almost all at once. So yeah, I was able to put 
money away and replenish my savings. And then probably first, I don't know how many years of business, at least five, I would start off the year not taking a salary out of the business, just drawing off savings, let the money and the business build up, and then either take a big lump sum or something along that line. Even once I got out of that, I was taking what many would consider a very reduced salary during the year. And then, and I still do that today. I, I operate on a reduced salary and I, I have these harvest bunches where when I know we're okay and we don't need the money and we're making money, I'll take that and it, it's actually kind of become my savings plan. So it was like, wow, I did it. And I thought I'd be looking for a job. Right. I remember having those thoughts. I, I thought I'd be looking for a job right now. I did it. I actually made my salary and I, I made a little bit more and I made it on my own. Really good feeling to be able to do that and not really be encumbered by debt. We paid off our loan probably about three years in and we kind of stayed debt free after that. I did take advantage of the idle loan this mm -hmm. last year. First time I had borrowed in over 15 years. It was almost stupid not to take it. It kind of was. And we didn't know what we were up against and maybe still don't, but I feel like we're coming out of it at this point. Although the supply chain was, uh, I thought the supply chain was much more elastic than it actually is proving to be. Yeah. So that's for sure. Yeah. So today, how long have you been in business? I think we're completing our 23rd year, starting our 24th. And when you first started, it sounds like it was just you. You didn't hire employees right out of the gate. Correct. Mm -hmm. At what point did you make your first hire and what was that process like for you? I failed miserably. So what I would do is I would sell during the day and do service during the day because I was also the person doing the implementations and doing the support. And of course, Sage was on the West Coast. So I was placing all my orders starting five o'clock central time. I had from five to seven uh, central time to place my orders. And so my first hire was for a, an office person, bookkeeper, account manager, somebody to answer the phone when I'm out in the field working with customers, somebody to place the orders for me, somebody to pay the bills, do the accounting, because I was doing all of that as well. And uh, hired somebody. It was a great person. wasn't their fault. I just learned that I didn't ask enough information. I assumed they knew how to do spreadsheets. I assumed they could work in an accounting package. I didn't do any testing, you know, of capabilities. The first month, I was just like, what am I going to do? I knew it wasn't going to work. I was out of the office, not able to spend enough time training this person. And the basic skill sets weren't there. I assumed too much. I assumed everybody knew Word. Everybody knew Excel. And I figured I could just teach putting into the accounting system. So yeah, she ended up taking a position with the bank, which I was in their building and also there. So it was great, great, good for her. Parted and on good terms. It was. And anybody who knows me, it's really hard for me to part with an employee. I, I take a lot of responsibility when I hire somebody because I know it's, they're making a big decision. You know, always operated on employees get paid always and they get paid first. And Absolutely. I get paid second. Yep. Yeah. With, without a doubt. The basis of the employee-employer relationship is timely and accurate pay. Yeah. If you violate that, then there's nothing left. Yeah. And we probably, again, feel like that's a staple. Everybody does that, right? Well, my tenure in public accounting taught me that there were people all over the place that were borrowing against their employee, and I was not going to do that. And if they didn't borrow against their employee, they borrowed against the government, which you really don't want to do that. Right. If they weren't borrowing against their employees, they were borrowing against their payroll taxes. That's just bad business. We had an employee several years ago, and I don't even remember what the hiccup was, but something didn't get set up in payroll and payday came around and he's like, Hey, where's my check? And I'm, what do you mean? Where's your check? And he's like, I didn't get a deposit. And at that point it wasn't okay. We got to figure out why this didn't happen. It was, I got to figure out how quickly I can get money into your bank account. And so it was, I'm going straight to the bank and I'm like, okay, give me your banking information. I'm going to get a wire to you today. We'll figure out how to you know deal with all the 
withholdings and all that after the fact, but it is right. critical to me. It is important to me that I get you money today mm-hmm. so that we can, you know, I've fulfilled my end of this bargain. And um, anyway, yeah, that's, you operate the same way. It's exactly how we handled the support calls when the customers would call in and say, hey, my direct deposit didn't go. It would be, okay, the entries happened. The money hasn't moved. Let's just move the money. In the realization of what you have to offer as a business owner, and everybody has something to offer, and everybody has something different to offer. Uh, One of the things we realized is a lot of these solutions don't have to be technical, right? They're business solutions, like just like that one. If I go to my system and I record a payroll and the money just doesn't move, just move the money. Don't worry about undoing and redoing to try to make the money move, but you'll be surprised about how many people who will undo and redo transactions to make money move. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, no, no, no. There's, there was a, we'll figure out why the money didn't move and so that it won't continue to happen. But all that hasn't happened here is money hasn't moved. Let's just move it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you've always run the business very lean, it sounds. You're very diligent in how you, you paid yourself. And going into that first hire, I recognize that it didn't work out the way that you wanted it to. Was there fear and trepidation about bringing on that first employee or were you at a point in the business that you were just like, no, this is, this is so easy. This is a no brainer. No, I mean, it was at the point where I needed help. I need somebody to do this and uh, I can't do it all myself. I need somebody else. And I've tried with all my hires to hire people that can do different things. I'm frequently tell people, I don't need a bunch of people who are just alike. I need a bunch of different people who are good at different things, Mm -hmm. specifically things I'm not good at. I'm always looking for somebody to do what I can't do. And then, of course, as the business has grown and and I've had to relinquish responsibility and recognize I'm no longer good at this anymore, I need to let somebody else do it because um, I'm too distracted with other things. Is it hard for you to relinquish responsibility as the business owner? Not for the last 10 years. It's hard to find people willing to take the initiatives that you want them to and equally as hard to get them to understand that you want them to take that initiative. So you've got two challenges ahead of you. The first challenge is you want somebody who's going to take initiative, you know, ask for forgiveness, not for permission, right? And even if you've found somebody who's totally gets that and is willing to do it. Now you got to make sure they understand that you're okay with that Mm -hmm. because they've been trained by all their previous performance that, yeah, all their previous employers. Yeah. That I know I said that, but I didn't really mean it. It's okay to go out there and make mistakes and do things. So it is. And I'm a big believer that, you know, when things don't work out, you look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, it's your fault. And, you know, how are you going to correct this and how are you going to do it better next time? So you said that in the last 10 years, it's been really easy to delegate and shed responsibilities. In the first part of your career, was it harder? I think it was just like a lot of people. I think I fell into that trap of, I know how to do this. I can do it better myself. It'll just be faster if I do it myself. It has literally taken me the last probably half of this business venture to get into more of the mindset that I wished I had in the first. And that is how people had treated me. They left me with stuff with infinite patience. I remember being out at a small county in Texas and calling my audit partner and saying, I don't know how to do this. And his answer was, neither do I, but you can't come home until you'd figure it out. <laughs> so, and oh, we probably charged two weeks worth of labor for that audit, and I was there for months. But I came out having a deep understanding of how county governments work and how the county government finance system works. And I just used it over and over and over. So I'm very thankful that I had that kind of leadership when I was younger, just out of school. My fault took me way too long 
to get to that. And as each year goes by, you know, I get better at it. Do you remember the first thing that you handed off to somebody and said, I'm going to let you run with this? The first thing? Well, I probably did it. I probably did it back when I was director of finance. It was a bank wreck. It was like, I'm not going to help anymore with this bank wreck. I say, it's a bank wreck is nothing but differences. You got two books. Just tell me what the differences are. And they would come in, they'd start telling me a story. And I said, well, how much are you off? And I said, oh, we're off, you know, $5,700. And I said, you don't know what all the differences are. I really don't need a story. I just need to know what all the differences are. Then I can tell you what to do with the differences. I was playing goalie, you know, just kicking the puck back into play. Again, I almost lost an employee over that because they couldn't do it. And that not taking it away from them was just driving them bananas. I don't know that there's a perfect way to do it, but I started back then. Probably when I have it all figured out is when I'm no longer doing the solution sales in my business, but I've got other people doing it for me. That's the Alamo. That's the last stronghold. So let's actually kind of drill into that for a second. When you started the company, you were selling the work, you were doing the work before you hired your first person, you were sending the orders off to the partner. Obviously, you're not doing all of those things now. What does the day-to-day -day look like for you today? Oh, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. You know, a lot of it is self-motivation. What do I need to be looking at today? It's easy for me to get distracted and sidetracked. There's probably two tracks going right now is developing opportunities and introducing people to Sage Intact. That's a full-time job. And if I can find the right person, I probably need help there. The second side is marketing. Just like you hated accounting, I, I hated <laughs> the marketing classes. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Doesn't make sense to me. Two plus two doesn't equal four. So I've struggled with contractors, struggled with making sense out of our spend. We just keep increasing the spend, but I, I still struggle with that. And I've decided, I've learned how to fly an airplane. I've learned how to ride a motorcycle. I've learned how to scuba dive. Surely I can figure out marketing. Surely I can learn this somehow. So I am spending part of my time there because just delegating and just spending in-house, out-house, it seems to always come back to me anyway. Okay. It's like, well, Mike, this is your company. You need to invest more time in it. That's what the marketing people usually end up telling me in the end. My um, marketing people have never told me that. <laughs> you've got the right people. <laughs> so you're doing a great job at it. I'm a fan at what you do. Yeah, it's a mystery to me. I And I don't know what to do with it. And I'm spending large amounts of money and I don't know what I'm doing with it. How are you going about learning? You talked about you learned to fly an airplane, you learned to scuba dive, you learned to ride a motorcycle. How are you going about learning how to be a marketer? I don't know that I could quantify that because it's changed and it continues to change as well as our business. I've I've redesigned the business three times now. I'm a, And this last time was almost like a start over from the very beginning. Um, Meaning you've changed your brand or you've changed your business model or both? I don't know that I've changed my brand. I've changed our business model. We're now a fully a subscription business. Our solutions now focus around software as a service. And um, we will talk to you longer than you and I have been talking today about why we think small business needs to get off of solutions that are installed on any premise specifically for you. I don't care if you're installing it on your server, a server at your IT company's co-location, hardened facility in Georgia, on you know Amazon or Microsoft. If you're managing an installation specific to you, I think you're wasting your business's attention and resources, and that's become the mission. Has anything major changed in your business with the pandemic? Not external, but internally? Yes. <laughs> Do you want me to say it out loud? So you and I went different directions. You bought a place. I got rid of my place. So we are totally 100% virtual. We have no physical offices. 
you know, we do have a relationship with my old landlord. I can get a uh, conference room on demand, probably get a cubicle on demand if I wanted to. There's a number of WeWork type places in Waco that I can engage as well. We initially made those relationships really concerned that we weren't going to have an office. To be honest, we've in the last two, what's now been two years going on two and a half, we've only used the, uh, those facilities maybe twice. People have really gotten accustomed to meeting virtually. And it, I think even before the pandemic, there was a strong comfort level with that. But with the pandemic, I mean, that wall's been completely shattered. It did. It, it shoved us over the edge. And by doing so, I mean, we're way more efficient. So if you just look at drive time, I mean, I used to have probably an hour drive time to get to work and back. Lunch probably ate up an extra, you know, 30 minutes or so getting, going to lunch someplace and coming back. The act of getting to your office and getting going and getting set up, I don't have any of that now. I mean, it's uh, the distance from my coffee maker to my office is less than 30 seconds. I'm more effective at cutting off the day now at five because I've worked a, har a hard day. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. So working from home for me, it's actually significantly harder for me to cut it off. It's so much easier to work right up until my wife says, hey, you know, dinner's on the table, come on in and eat. And then it's easy for me to walk back in there after I'm done. So you've been really effective at, at drawing those boundaries. So what you need to do is you need to adopt a small furry critter. <laughs> <laughs> my beagle, who I adopted during the pandemic, I rescued, he's like a small child. He comes and gets me at five every day. He's your alarm clock. Yeah. And there's been a few days when I've had meetings go on to six, right? It happens. But yeah, he comes in and I, he's got I the know. got puppy dog eyes and yeah. he's telling you. But more than that, I know I've put in a pretty hard day. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I have to make myself like take breaks for lunch and things like that. But if I do need to do something or go run an errand or do whatever I need to do, I don't feel bad about that one or two hours because I'm saving one to two hours every day over previous activities. It's kind of interesting now for me to go to my car and my car's got like a diary on it. And to see that my car hasn't moved for a couple of days. Yeah. It usually moves once at least every three days. But a lot of times I'll take the bicycle or I'll take the motorcycle and the car doesn't move. And then, of course, our travel expenses. We used to travel to every meeting. So being in Waco, I could be in Dallas in an hour and a half. I could be in Austin in an hour and a half. I could be in San Antonio or Corpus a couple hours longer. In the plane, I can be in Corpus in two hours. So my carbon footprint for our company was was pretty big uh, pre-pandemic, and now it's almost nothing. You think about that methodology. If I go to a city and meet with customers, I can really only effectively meet with two customers tops in a day. Yeah. Okay. If I'm chained to my desk, meeting virtually, now I'm talking to four, five, sometimes six customers in a single day. Mm -hmm. So my ability to leverage my expertise across individuals is greatly increased by me not moving. Do you miss the face-to-face -face, though? I turn on my camera and I find if I turn on my camera, other people turn on the cameras. So I don't miss it as much. I Guilty pleasure, okay. I miss the drive time. What do you do on your drive time? Well, I would listen to a book or I would listen to talk radio or I used to have satellite radio. I don't anymore, but I did for the drive time. I would listen, kind of like people, now I watch YouTube instead, right? If I want to take a break, I'll, I'll watch YouTube. Uh, something I want to gain expertise in, usually not work-related, right? Mm -hmm. like, like how to tune my bicycle better, uh, you know, or, or to do, you know, to perform better when I'm cycling. But yeah, I miss that drive time, which would be usually an hour to an hour and a half of just mind-numbing, yeah. you know, listening to the radio. I have a very short commute, but I do enjoy getting, you know, 10 minutes of a podcast in or 10 yeah. minutes of an audio book in wherever I can. So looking back at over 20 years in business, what is one thing that you point to that you would say, man, this is why we've made it this long. This is what has made us successful. I won't quit. 
I mean, that's really it. And to anybody listening in their 20s, just don't quit. If I stayed at the CPA firm, I would have been partner. It was one of the reasons I left. I didn't want to be partner. I felt like the other side of the fence was greener pastures. If I had stayed at that company, I would have eventually been on executive staff. And now that I'm in my business, I, I just keep working the problem. I don't give up. I don't quit. And also being in business this long, and it doesn't really take this long, that long to figure it out when you're in business, your circumstances are going to change on you frequently, yearly. I always tell people running a business is like a jigsaw puzzle on the kitchen table. Except somebody sneaks in in the middle of the night and they take a part of the puzzle that you had already done and they cut the pieces into different shapes. And you've got to figure out, you thought you had that taken care of and now you got to figure out how to put it all back together again. Because the rules of business and, and your partners change regularly. And I don't know if you've figured this out, Scott, but you are the consistency. I'm the consistency. My customers have known me longer than anybody at Sage. And that's because the folks at Sage have rotated through. And the people that they've had experience with are, are gone. But we've been the consistency. We've been the, the glue that gets them from one season into another or one thing into another. So just not giving up. I'm, I don't know how to describe that very well. I've got a prospective customer right now who's worried about my age you know i'm worried that you're not going to be around and i'm like well what else am i going to do if my business goes out of business i'm still going to be here and i'm still going to be interested in accounting information flow and solving problems with software as a service doesn't really kind of doesn't matter Mm -hmm. just like the other things i love to do i'm going to continue to do this so just not quitting not giving up I think that's why I made it the first year and kind of kept going. Yeah, It was like something kicked in. It was like, okay, I can do better than that. I can make this work. You talked about how, had you stayed in public accounting, you know, you could see a clear path to being on the executive team and, and, yeah. and being a partner. I think for a lot of people, the ambition is to get to the top. But I think it's so important that you had the self-awareness back then to say, I know I can get to the top. That's not where I want to be. That's not the ladder that I want to climb. Do you ever think back like how different your life would be if you had stayed? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think everybody does. That's why those shows like Ordinary Joe were fascinating, you know, or what would have it been like had I made a different decision? But again, you know, when people ask you, what would you do differently? I don't know that I would do anything differently because it created who I am today and if I did something differently, I would be a different person. From a financial s- standpoint, I'd probably have more money and I'd probably be deeper in debt. I've been financially free for 15 years now. I'm not going back. Why do you say you would have more money, but you would be deeper in debt? debt? Yeah. Oh, because I would have tried to keep up with my peer group. I would have elevated my housing. I would have elevated my circumstance. I would have financed more. It was one of the few places that took a break every day. Like all the partners and all the staff would break together once a day or twice a day, actually. And people would talk about what they were doing. And I still know some of these guys. I'd probably, you know, have a couple of VRBOs and, you know, some other things going on. And I kind of went the other way. I kind of just simplified everything. I didn't do other more complex financial investments. And of course, there's, uh, I think every American, if they have the idea, they should start their own business. Because there's just so many benefits to being a business owner that you just don't get when you're an employee and just somebody's, you know, paying you a W-2. It's not for everybody. It's not. And there are times when I was like, oh, some days where I, was, I wish I was an employee today because I would just quit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would just quit and go find a job <laughs> somewhere else. Uh, but I never thought that. Really? No. (laughs) That was a lie. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's like a marriage. You just can't walk away from your responsibility. Uh, You got to show up for it every day and you can't be down. You've got to be on. Some days you're like, okay, where do I find it? I got to find it. Here's all the pieces of the puzzle. Where do I find it? And where's my blue sky? Oh, here it is. And 
focus on the blue sky and forget about the storm and just focus on that and get through it. And then you look up and you're like, huh, I got, yeah, got through two stock market crashes, 9-11, COVID. I think it's just determination. So you've already said that everybody should figure out what the idea is and go start their business. For the people that have the idea and have made the decision, what advice would you give to somebody that's starting a business today? So the best advice that friends gave me before I started the business was, number one, learn how to live without money. I didn't understand it when I heard it either. I was like, what? Yeah, I could, You have to have money. You've got to pay the rent, got to pay... But, you know, like I said, I figured out a way to draw my net pay from savings, right, for a period of time. What that really means is you need to be in a position where you're not having to make business decisions because you personally need money. That's where small business owners get into trouble. That's when they start borrowing against their employees or borrowing against the IRS. Or they just overspend and run out of money. And the example that this friend used was he had some business property that he leased and and one of the places was a restaurant. And he said, you know, it was a great restaurant. It was a great concept. But he closed the doors after four months because he ran out of money. And it was like four months in the restaurant, but people don't even know you're there yet. So number one how are you going to stay? You need staying power. How can you measure that staying power? That's what learn how to live without money means. Or you've got to be able to master that part of your life, right? You don't have to have a lot of money. Like I said, I started my business with what it would take to buy a, probably a very nice used Suburban. It doesn't have to be a lot. It might based on your business. If you, Restaurants take a lot of money. If you're an equipment rental business, it takes millions to get going. So whatever it is, how are you going to have the staying power to not have to make decisions because your cash balance is not what you think it would be? That's number one. Number two is you have to invest in it. Uh, The reason I'm not a professional photographer today is I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't buck up the money to get lights like you have here, the medium format cameras that were required in the day, the facility to hang the paper, you know, all these things that you have here. I was in college and I wasn't willing to spend thousands of dollars of initial investment to do it. So you have to invest. And the third is, I'll take the bankers. Don't plant radishes. So when I asked him what he meant by that, what what are you talking about? I plant, I need to know how to plant radishes. He goes, well, I might be planting this really nice crop, but I know I can have radishes in so many weeks. I looked at him and I said, you know what? If I don't focus on my dream and my vision, what he wanted me to say was that I would do public accounting on the side, that I would do tax returns. That was all that was standing between me and that loan, was me saying that I was willing to do public accounting, uh, tax returns, bookkeeping, whatever. I said, if I don't pursue this dream to help small businesses with software, I'll never get there. I will become what I do. And therefore, I need to do what I want to become. And yeah, just go for it and do it. If you think it through financially, it might turn into a spend of money, right? But it was an experience. And if you fail, you fail. And you're employable. The biggest lie in the world is that if I give up this job, I won't be able to find another one. That's just the biggest lie there is. If you don't believe me, go into any business right now. They need people. A lot of the people working in the business don't care if they're there or not. So don't ever think you're not of value, that you're not going to be able to recapture that or get it someplace else. It's just a lie. In the next lifetime, maybe, I can tell you how to get out of a business once you get into one. (laughs) I don't know how to do that right now. That's the cost of success, is now I have people dependent on me and customers dependent on me, and I just can't get mad and quit tomorrow morning. Awesome. Well, Mike, thanks for making the drive up and being a part of this today. My pleasure.
That was Mike DeRosa, founder of DeRosa Mangold Consulting. To learn more, visit DeRosaMangold.com. If you or a founder you know would like to be a guest on In the Thick of It, email us at intro at founderstory.us. 